Thank you. Thank you very much. In the first place, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me um, at this very valuable uh, meeting. Um, it's been kind of difficult situations for all of us, and we've unfortunately we've only been um, able to see each other on the screen just like two days ago when um, we had a big Interpol meeting and everybody was so sorry. But this is a great opportunity. I know that um, in my title, it says emerging field. I know that India, and I consider India as the emerging field in forensic odontology. I am absolutely amazed and pleased uh, to see how um, forensic odontology takes off in India at all university. And that is a great, a great achievement. I also admire all of you for all the scientific research uh, that you produce. Um, so as in the introduction, you know, there was referred to 1979 uh, being the um, uh, year of birth uh, of Dr. Aman. Um, I started my career in forensic odontology at that time. So what I'm going to do today um, uh, for you is I'm going to I'm going to go to the past and I will take you on a journey from the past to the present and then see um, what the future will bring us. Um, and I think it is important to realize that um, without um, without the past, we wouldn't have a present. And without the present and the past, we wouldn't have a future. So everything that we um, that we do now, that we see now, uh, that we research on, that um, we uh, will do in the future, um, will be linked somewhere. Um, to the past will be linked somewhere to today's situation. And let me go back real, real far. Let me go back to Dr. Oscar Amoedo, uh, end of the 19th century, Bazar de la Charité. I call him the godfather. Here it says the father, but you could say he's the godfather of forensic odontology. Um, what he did, the book that he produced afterwards, L'Art d'Antera, Médecine Légale, is really that's, that's, I describe it sometimes as the Bible of forensic odontology. And I'm always very surprised, I should say, by, um, I got a copy of that book. I got a copy of that original book. And when I'm, when I'm flipping through it, I'm, I am very often amazed about how these things that go back to the book was published in 1987, I believe, uh, 18, 1897, um, how some of these things are still actual and could still be applied on uh, cases of today. So I think that is amazing. Um, Sir and Kaiser Nilsson from Denmark in 1970, I, I had the, uh, um, the pleasure of knowing Sir uh, quite well, and he gave a good definition. Um, he says he described or defined uh, forensic odontology as that brand of odontology which deals with the proper handling of examination of dental evidence and the proper evaluation and presentation of dental findings in the interest of justice. I circled the word proper because that is very important. Proper in this meaning stands for quality wise. And yes, the standards of quality in 1970 were maybe different because the dental evidence that we had to deal with was different. The knowledge that we had about forensic odontology and odontology and dentistry was different. So our evaluation of the dental findings that we found may have been a little bit of different, but still the basic principles of forensic odontology remain the same. We only have got more tools. We got new materials. There are new scientific discoveries. I call it new scientific discoveries that we can apply or that we do apply to forensic odontology. I call it cross-contamination. And that has been, over the last decades, have been, has been a very, very important thing. It's been like that in dentistry, our basic science. But it's been like that in forensic dentistry as well. There have been new ethical and legal regulations countries have discovered forensic odontology. It's part of their um, life. It's part of their everyday visions. So there have to be legal regulations. We have to adapt ourselves. We can't 
come up with the same conclusions in the same way as we did 30 years ago. It requires different things. And there are new visions. People are looking into the future constantly and are constantly looking, what can we do? How are we going to do it? And let me then take you back through all the different um, subdivisions of forensic odontology. Uh, why? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to look with you, what did we have and what new techniques do we have now in these different, or can we apply now in these different subdivisions? Um, we're going to look at identification of unknown individuals. And yes, for sure, there are so many new things that we can apply for identifications, things that didn't exist a couple of decades ago. Bite mark analysis. We all know how it has been uh, under a curfew uh, in the US uh, and, and uh, probably uh, totally justified. So if we want to uh, bring bite mark analysis back as a science, um, we'll have to look into new technologies and see, okay, can we make it more scientific again? And can we make it acceptable for court and justice? Not just in the United States, there were a couple of cases, well, quite a number of cases there where bite mark analysis was under scrutiny and was, was debated and actually made wrong decisions based on bite mark analysis. Um, we'll have to look seriously in that. And IOFOS and Interpol has created work groups on that and uh, scientific research is done all over the world at this moment to bring bite mark analysis back into into a reliable science dental age estimation we all know dental age estimation is a huge field of research that's been done all over the world and with reasons we'll look into that as well dna profiling dna i'm a little worried about dna and i'm sure i'm not the only one as a forensic odontologist um I see a tendency in forensic sciences and police uh, people um, to go for DNA regardless of other evidence. And there might be, uh, there might be reasons for that. Um, as I will tell you later, and you all know that um, odontology is a primary identifier, as is DNA. So my opinion in that is, if you have an identification based on a primary identifier like, um, like odontology, why would you need DNA to confirm that? They don't ask us to confirm DNA identification by dental means. So what works in one direction should work in the other direction. I think that for us odontologists, there is a huge task and there is a huge fight uh, for the future that will go on. It does not only have to do with science, in my opinion, but it also has to do with um, money, with politics, um, with police labs, with scientific police people uh, wanting to do it all by themselves. Um, recently, I came across uh, a couple of publications on kiloscopy and rugoscopy. Um, in, the meet in the Interpol meeting, we heard uh, Emilio was there as well. Good morning, Emilio. I can see you on the bottom of the screen. Um, <laughs> and we heard a very interesting presentation from somebody from uh, Hungary about um, rugoscopy. Um, facial reconstruction is another subdivision that we will, um, we will talk about. Uh, sorry, we go into the other direction. Good, we're going back in the past. We all know this. Bazar de la Charité, and um, some of those people were identified by this drawing that's this beautiful antemortem record from Dr. Devonport, um, who was one of the treating dentists of the noble people in Paris, and he had remarkable, remarkable uh, good antemortem records. Um, you will probably agree with me that we can only, um, we can only dream uh, today of this kind of detailed um, records. Um, but that was that was the past. Where did we go from there? Well, we went from handwritten um, uh, dental records um, and the, the regular um, x-rays as we know them. Um, we go to um, software, we go to encrypted, integrated, simplified. Um, at my age, I don't, don't always think it's that simplified. Uh, but that's more it says more about me than it says about the system itself and we go into digital 
uh, records we go into software, which should in theory give us um, better antemortem records. I say in theory, it's not always the case because it still depends on the practicing dentist. The practicing dentist, the treating dentist is the key factor to antemortem records. If he doesn't write it down, if she doesn't put it into the computer correctly, we have a problem. Regardless, all the scientific, all the, the, the software that we have. So we are very uh, depending on them there. Um, so in, in, in dental identification, um, as, I, as I explained, you know, we'll have the challenge, we'll have the battle with DNA, and we probably will have to come up with, with some good ideas um, why um, odontology has to be preferred over um, other primary methods like DNA. Um, last week, we concluded our uh, training program for 13 dentists. Um, I did it with our chief commander of the Belgian Federal DVI Federal Police Squad. And um, as we were debriefing, he said, you know, Eddie, um, for me, um, if it's available, um, fingerprinting, another primary identifier, is my first choice because it's the fastest, it's the cheapest. But unfortunately, you don't always have fingerprinting. So my second one is odontology because it's quick, it's easy, it's cheap. Only then comes DNA. Not everyone shares that opinion. Um, we'll have to we'll have to fight for turf there, and that's an that's a huge um, challenge, I think. Another challenge in identification is that um, we all know that there is a reduction in carriers. There is an increase in orthodontic treatment, which means that a lot of our antemortem situations are going to be carriers free perfectly pepsid and smile dentitions all looking alike so that is um that is well not a problem it's a luxury problem but it is a problem for us as um a forensic odontologist in identification so we'll have to go to um, some new techniques then and i discussed with one of my friends uh, earlier this week I said, Walter, tell me something more about uh, the use of 3D imaging. He said, oh, that's easy. You just scan it. You scan your teeth, you scan your facial um, uh, uh, feature, and um, you can do the same thing. And even if you have destruction, um, you don't need special software programs. You don't need, you can just do a superimposition and um, you can compare your antemortem with your postmortem. And he was giving the, me the example, he, he and his wife are orthodontists, and he said, we take, uh, at the end of the treatment, we take a 3D image, and even we can compare that years later, and even if there has been huge attrition, um, the program will still recognize them, because you got anatomical shapes that you can compare. It's the same with an occlusal surface. Um, if you scan it, and you scan a post-mortem, you can easily compare these things. You can superimpose um, uh, these two images. Um, you can print 3D imaging, 3D printing um, is very, uh, very, very um, uh, useful for that. And definitely, as we can see here, definitely in um, identification. If we got an image like this here, um, all these, um, these cusps and these fissures and these anatomical construction, they are so unique. So if we can do that, if we have that antemortem and we can do that postmortem, um, we have we can have a perfect match. Same goes for dental cone beam CT scans, also dental uh, digital imaging, um, where we can very easily, um, you know, um, uh, almost autopsy the complete dentition. You know, we can make cuts in horizontal ways, in vertical ways at uh, no matter um, what position of the jaw. Uh, so that means that we can look at details at all levels. Um, I've seen some uh, interesting research articles about the use of, of dental cone beam CT for age estimation, which makes sense. Um, you can use these and you can, you can very detailed and, and um, uh, look at the different kind of um, positions and teeth. Um, you can even do segmentations at root levels and use these for um, identification. 
Um, dental age estimation. Again, we're going back in the past. Um, history of teeth as an age indicator, 1833. Um, the, there were some limitations for children to work in factories and mills, and it was based on the physical appearance. Now, we all know that that is very, very subjective. A little bit later came a new law uh, in uh, the UK, and it said that children under seven could not be held responsible for crimes committed. But the problem they had was there was no birth registration. So Thompson, 1836, said if the third molar has not um, uh, erupted yet, there can be no hesitation in affirming that the culprit has not passed his seventh year. And of course, by the third molar, he was not a dentist, he was a doctor. Uh, by the third molar, he meant the first permanent molar which, yes, erupts mostly around six years of age. And today we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't do it that way, but it was a way. Uh, a more scientific approach came by Edwin Saunders, who presented a um, uh, publication to the British Parliament, teeth uh, test uh, of age, and that was based on the eruption of teeth on 1,000 children. Now we're talking um, a good under than and 70 year, 75 years back here, and as you can read here, it was based on the eruption of teeth. Now, we all know that we wouldn't do that anymore these days. We would go for the development of teeth. And we have different, different uh, systems um, for that. Um, what's the research about in dental age estimation um, in this period? Um, globalize, the globalization is a problem. Uh, people move all over the world. We find people we very often don't know exactly where they come from. We see more and more interracial relations. And that, of course, will produce a problem um, if we are looking at reference groups from different ethn ethnicities. You know, if a Caucasian person marries a, a Black person, you know, we, we count which, which uh, charts, uh, which um, reference groups are we going to have to use. That, that might be a problem. Our other biggest problem is improving the accuracy, um, especially where we are around this, this critical age of 18, which is more, in most countries um, being minor or, or not. And it can mean the difference between a youth uh, institution or prison. Um, so there, I think that comb beam CT um, might be of a great use um, for us. Another uh, use, and, and I came across that as well in a publication by Sheila Manika. Um, she said, well, we might have to grow in the future through chemical or DNA source um, to do an age um, determination. And um, I know that in, at KU Leuven, Catholic University in Leuven in Belgium, uh, they have been doing some uh, basic research on DNA methylation markers. And they say, well, in a couple of years, we'll be able to give you more accurate age estimation from DNA than you can do with teeth. Um, well, wait and see. Um, another publication here from, uh, from Sheila. Um, where um, on comb beam CT images, um, she's looking at, or she and her group at least, is looking at the um, volume of the pulp. And um, you can see that there is a difference um, in the, the, um, the anatomical size in uh, the, the total amount of surface um, which is then indicated, and which can be calculated, and I've seen some of those by um, artificial intelligence. Um, last year, we had this um, webinar by our friends, um, by my friend Prava from uh, the university in uh, Malaysia, who was also uh, talking about um, three-dimensional age estimation using cone beam CT in Malaysian population. And it can be done um, for any teeth. It's just a matter of, okay, we have to put somebody on that research and way to go from there. Bite mark analysis. 
very important and I, I um, told you a little bit about it. Um, well, we know, we all know that in the States it was on a fire um, by the White House and it was banned, it was considered junk science. Um, that's not what we want. Um, and the decision was correct. And it said in the justification, it said that forensic science uh, results should be repeatable, reproducible, and accurate. And I will come back to those elements um, later and give you maybe a suggestion um, how we can use that. Um, the reason for that, and I'm, I'm trying not to go out of time, so I'll go more quickly over this, was that we all know the Innocence Project um, where, as far as now, over 50 people have been released from prison after convictions, convictions based on dental evidence. But then um, if, you, if you read the bottom uh, paragraph, it says, um, the canine teeth made a pretty good alignment with the husband's teeth. Would you dare to write this down and have somebody being convicted just based, based on the fact that one tooth makes a pretty good alignment with the dentition of a suspect. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sleep at night um, if I did that. Um, for the future, um, new techniques, use of portable four-dimensional imaging technology for image um, capture, um, 3D scanning, 3D printing, again, is gonna be uh, good for that. Um, another um, issue that can be used, and I see that Jill Keyes' name is on it, is DNA and bacteria. Um, Sheila Manika man, um, uh, mentioned it in her um, article um, as well. She said DNA and bacteria that can be found uh, in the bitten area can give us an, um, an indication of the perpetrator. Uh, but DNA, of course, is unique and the bacterial composition of our saliva seems to be quite um, unique as well. So there is some future, there is some uh, research to be done uh, in that area as well. What are the problems? Um, it, the, the way bite mark analysis is conducted uh, these days it is not uh, very objective. Um, it, it leaves a lot of room for um, subjective um, observations for subjective conclusions. And that is basically the reason why it's dismissed as a science in courts in the US. So again, in recapitulation, uh, new techniques, 3D imaging, ultraviolet and infrared photography, digital processing of the images and artificial intelligence in comparisons, in comparison of the um, bite mark um, traces that we find with suspects dentition. Uh, here a little example of a 3D scanning, how it can be done. And then I'm sure with a good software program, we can make this, uh, these teeth, this dentition fit into the, um, the left bite marks on uh, a victim. So um, I think from what I've told you so far, it's quite clear that um, we can go in different directions. And whether we'll be in the north, on the left, in uh, Spitsbergen, uh, close to the North Pole, and the picture on the right seems somewhere in the south, looking at the sky, um, it's the same thing. We can go in different directions and we should explore all the possibilities. Um, our basic idea there in there should be that we should do a proper handling. And remember what Søren Kaiser Nielsen said in the 70s, proper handling of our findings. Nice book, Evidence-Based Forensic Dentistry. Um, word to look at, word to read. The basic idea was that it should, our conclusions, our methods um, should withstand the scrutiny of the different legal systems wherever in the world uh, it might be. And then I'm coming to this, to this Six Sigma principle, the Six Sigma process. Uh, which is a business management strategy uh, whereby 99.9966% of the manufactured products are statistically free of flaws or defects. 
that means that there are only 3.4 defects per million, 3.4 defects or um, mistakes per million. Wouldn't that be nice in forensic odontology, that if we have 1 million conclusions on whatever kind of um, examination that we're doing, that there would only be three and a half uh, that could eventually be wrong. Um, the purpose is to produce a specific and true result that can be validated. Very important. Validation is very important. Um, and to come to that final result, uh, that should be the result of planned actions. And again, they should be scientific, they can be validated. And just look at the picture on the right, um, where these two scientists um, have written uh, this algorithm down. Uh, but in the middle there, look what it says. And then a miracle occurs, and from there he goes on. So the other one tells him, I think you should um, be more explicit there in step two. And this is what still happens uh, too often these days uh, in forensic odontology. Um, we take things for granted. We don't look why, we don't look how, and we just uh, run to conclusions like that. Um, so my question for all of you, if this can be done in the industry, why is it not possible in forensic sciences? Why don't we Six Sigma forensic science? It only has to do with validation of the method, traceability, and quality guarantee. A um, couple of um, articles about quality assurance. And we all know these names. IOFOS has created a work group as well, quality assurance in forensic odontology. That's all part of the Six Sigma process. Um, and, and again, it's a couple of questions. May we not expect to present in court a method that had less faults than producing a mobile phone? 3.4 per million errors. So we should be more precise, or we should be as precise. Why do we see so many controversies in forensic sciences? Well, it's easy. There has been no search for a simple process that minimalizes the risk of wrong handling. We're taking too much risk. We don't, we take too much things for granted. And here is the philosophy. Here is the, the concrete fulfillment of the Six Sigma process. We define what we want to look for. We measure, we analyze, we improve our method, and then we control it again. And this is an ongoing, on-running process to come to a valuable um, uh, method to a valuable and uh, method that can be um, uh, validated, that can be repeated, and that will always give us the same result. Um, you wouldn't end up like these people. You know, they've both done a great job, but just somewhere along the line, um, it went wrong. And as the comment says, it's easier to make simple things complex than to make complex things easy. But Forensic odontology isn't a simple thing. So we should make these complex things that forensic odontology is more easy by creating ways, by creating methods. Um, other uh, things for the future, uh, biochemical analysis. Uh, samples are taken from bone and teeth and are being anal analyzed in specified or in specialized laboratories, C14 dating, DNA analysis, isotope analysis. Um, the disadvantage of these methods is that they are time and money consuming. And as I said earlier, yeah, the forensic odontology is something that is easy, that is cheap, that is quick, not in these um, cases. But let's take a look, and we all know about DNA in teeth. We all know where we can extract DNA from teeth, bone, air follicles, blood, saliva, semen, and that will help us. Um, the oral sources, um, teeth, saliva, biopsy material, and that will, uh, that will lead us to um, good results if we want to do uh, DNA analysis. Um, different methods then from depending on what kind of source um, we are using for, for full teeth, for example, we can crush the entire tooth. We can do a conventional endodontic access by drilling a little hole and getting the pulp material out, a um, lot of cellular material there. We can do a vertical split of the entire tooth, horizontal um, sectioning. We can do a cryogenic grinding or an orthograde entrance technique. 
it doesn't matter really how we do it. The most important thing is that we get the cellular material out and that we get a source for um, DNA. Um, again, I'm referring again to the method from University in Leuven, uh, DNA methylation. It was a preliminary research. I think they are still um, working on it. I haven't seen any further publications uh, so far. Vertopsy, um, Emilio, I'm not going to go too much into that. I know you're going to talk about it later, but still, it's a new method, um, not invasive at all. Um, still, um, in a way, some uh, problems. Um, and here on the left, you see an, a regular periapical X-ray. Um, you see the clinical photographs. And uh, on the right, you see the 3D. Uh, image from the vertopsy and yeah we still have some little problems but I'm sure Emilio is gonna um, let his light shine on that um, during his presentation. This one was interesting we got this from uh, Herman Bernitz from South Africa the Lodox something that is developed uh, or that was developed in the mining and the gold uh, industry there to check the workers to see if they hadn't swallowed um, little bullets of gold or diamonds when they were going home at night. Um, low dox, low doses of x-rays. Um, and it can be used and it has been used in single and mass fatality situations. Uh, Herman Bernitz has published about it. Um, here we see an example of what you see on these images. And I think, yeah, it gives it gives an idea. It's not very it's not detailed detailed, but still, um, when you look at these, um, it I would say um, it's not a positive identification, but it um, leads us into the direction of a probable identification, to be explored by other means um, at the same time. Artificial intelligence is really um, what's coming up in the last. Uh, decade, and uh, I think there is a huge future with artificial intelligence. And as our colleague from uh, Hungary uh, said during his presentation for Interpol, he said that um, we should try to do um, as less as human interference in our examinations. Why? Because a computer is going to be objective. So he, when when using artificial intelligence, um, we are eliminating the subjective factor that may lead us to wrong interpretations, uh, to personal interpretations of certain observations. Um, artificial intelligence in diagnosis. I've read articles where um, a, after a first visit and, and panoramic X-ray, the program, the artificial intelligence program, um, makes a complete, um, let's say, antemortem record of the patient. So it can produce an antemortem. If it can produce an antemortem, it can produce a postmortem records. I know at some universities, um, my friends from University of Zagreb are working on an um, artificial intelligence program uh, for comparison of AM and PM uh, records. So that would mean um, identification as a conclusion. Um, it can be used in age estimation, as we've seen before, you know, with comb beam CT, and then you launch a um, artificial intelligence software on that. Um, it can um, recognize your your um, in in dental anthropology. It will recognize your teeth. Um, it will describe your teeth. And I, again, I was discussing with my my friend orthodontist, and he said, well, if teeth have been extracted and the orthodontist did a good job. Sometimes it's hard to see. Well, with artificial intelligence, it will just recognize uh, these teeth. Um, so that that those things will be great um, uh, progress. Here are a couple of examples of X-rays, and then um, on, on the second in the green and the the red, uh, we see points of um, correspondence the, where the computer, where the program makes the comparison. Um, can be used in uh, facial recognition because that's another um, issue, um, facial reconstruction. Um, the um, artificial intelligence program 
can produce and can compare um, these phases that they've developed themselves and compare them with uh, antemortem uh, phases, superimpose them. So that's all um, great things for the future. Just a few words to finish about coloscopy and uh, rugescopy. Um, yeah, it's uh, coloscopy has been has been an, a subject within or a subdivision within forensic odontology that has been quiet in the 70s. I remember when I started, um, uh, it was a big thing in Japan. Professor Suzuki, Kazuo Suzuki, um, did a lot of research. Now we're coming back and we're coming back and start using uh, these lip prints eventually um, as ways of um, identifying. Same with palatal rugae, and I, I just want to refer to the, um, the presentation and the research of our colleague from Hungary. Um, he is doing some research on monozygotic twins, and he, as one of his conclusions to be looked after, he said, well, we're doing a research by the, the ana analyzing the palatal rugae uh, and that uh, we have an 80% positive result on ethnic origin and in the Caucasian uh, ethnic group, um, we have an 80% positive result on gender determination from palatal rugae. Isn't that a great thing for the future? Wouldn't that solve a lot of our problems that um, we are facing uh, these days? Just to, <laughs> just to finish on a, on a uh, humorous note, uh, I found this publication uh, last week, NFC prothesis. What you see in it is a little chip. And um, it says, um, well, it's more as a gimmick that I put it in, but there are some possibilities. Um, you can have your bank codes in there. So you pay with your denture. There is a chip there. Now in this chip, we could put other things. So we could put personal things, we could put individual things. So that would be easy to read and would eventually, yeah, denture marking, but then in a sophisticated way and with multi um, uh, applications. Fine. Um, my question's for you. Where are you going with this? Where will it take us? Um, how will we get there? Will we get there? And these three little guys um, on skateboards is from a German artist um, who uses uh, broken skateboards. And they are up in my waiting room uh, on the wall as dental art. And I always tell people, well, for me, that's my training guys for forensic odontology and identification. And it's not too difficult because they've got crowns, uh, gold crowns and I can make the distinction between the three of them. Thank you very much.